Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and Lord Green, thank you very much for a kind introduction. Uh, my name is Bruce Keogh. I'm a cardiac surgeon by background and uh, medical director of the National Health Service in England. But my job today is to welcome you to this uh, Global Business Summit on Assistive Medical Technologies. We've got quite an interesting program for you today, I think. Um, first of all, we're going to be visiting, or some of you will be visiting, Stoke Mandeville, which is the home of the Paralympic Games. Um, just round about the, the end of the, the last war, a Dr. Gutmann, a Jewish refugee from Germany, arrived in uh, Stoke Mandeville. He was a neurosurgeon. And he challenged the current practices of the day, which were to keep people in bed, some practices which still pertain in some parts of the world. And he put a regime in practice to get people out of beds as quickly as possible and told them to concentrate on what they could do, not what they couldn't do. And part of that was stimulating people to do competitive sport. And it was really from those humble beginnings that the Paralympics, which I think most of you will agree are so inspiring, were born. Secondly, we have a series of seminars with an impressive range of speakers this afternoon. And I would also like to ask you to look out for the futuristic displays of ideas for Paralympic sport. Those come from winner of a competition among students at Imperial College. And I think they demonstrate the flair and creativity of our engineers and designers to find solutions that will help people live their lives to the full. The main questions, I think, which we have to tackle today are how can innovation in design, engineering, IT, and clinical science enable everybody to live their lives to the full as best as they possibly can? Secondly, how can we support all ages to learn, communicate, and live more independently? And finally, particularly in the context of, of why we're here, how can we use sport to stimulate innovation in those areas? I'd like to thank our partners, the Royal Academy of Engineering, and some of you will know that they have an event tomorrow to try and answer the question of how sport can promote innovation in engineering, the Science and Innovation Network, and the Healthcare and Knowledge Transfer Network. But before we start, could I please ask you to switch off your phones? Um, to be aware that today's events are being recorded. And if the fire alarm goes off, it's the real thing. Um, as the NHS medical director, I've got responsibility for all clinical policy and strategy in the National Health Service. And the health service itself is, in my view, a really important sociological innovation, which came into being in 1948. And since then, this country has offered free health care to every single citizen, irrespective of their means. And I think that is one of the, the greatest achievements of, uh, of humankind. It reflects a degree of civilization and uh, care for the vulnerable uh, that I'm very proud of. But not only that, the UK has got a pretty impressive record in medical science and technology. Our NHS is seen in different lights in different parts of the world. But really, it provides a fantastic platform for, the res for research into, into medical science and technology. Let me just run through a few of the things that, uh, that have come out of uh, uh, the efforts of science in, in this country, with particular respect to medicine. First of all, the smallpox vaccine was developed by Edward Jenner in this country. And it's estimated that that vaccine alone has saved more lives than have been lost in all wars since man started fighting. A remarkable contribution to humankind. The ability to deal with sepsis during surgery, the sorts of soaps that are used to prevent bacteria infecting wounds were developed by Joseph Lister in this country. The identification of the mosquito as the carrier for malaria was discovered by Sir Ronald Ross in this country, who was the first Nobel Prize recipient uh, for medicine from, uh, from the UK. The theory of evolution evolved in this country. Between 1930 and 1970, there were six Nobel Prizes 
for British scientists who were trying to unravel how nerves in the, bodies work, in the body worked. The structure of DNA was unraveled in Cambridge. The sequencing of DNA was developed by a scientist in Cambridge, Frederick Sanger, the only person in the world ever to win the Nobel Prize for chemistry twice. The first anesthesia developed in the UK, the first blood transfusion in the UK, the first antibiotics in the UK. In my specialty, the ability to stop and restart the heart at will, which created the basis for modern heart surgery, developed uh, within a stone's throw of this building. The first test tube baby, Louise Brown, in the UK. She celebrated her 34th birthday last month. And 14 of the top 75 drugs in the world developed in the UK. And that's just in medicine. But if we start to look more specifically at medical technology, the microscope invented by Robert Hooke, which enabled the discovery of cells, fundamental building block of life, whether it's plant life or animal life, discovered in the UK. The thermometer invented in the UK, the ophthalmoscope for looking in people's eyes, the intraocular lens, the electrocardiogram, widely used everywhere, the CT scanner developed by uh, Godfrey Hounsfield, and the MRI by Peter Mansfield, two recipients of the Nobel Prize, all developed in the United Kingdom. And the end result of that is that we have the second greatest number of Nobel Prizes after the United States and the world, more maths and science graduates in the UK than any other European country. And what does that do? That's led to a thriving medical technology sector with over 3,000 uh, medical technology companies uh, functioning and thriving in the United Kingdom with a turnover of over 15 billion pounds a year. And many of those are here today. They're world leaders in orthopedics, in assistive technologies, in mobility products, and in telehealth and uh, telecare products. Assistive technologies means, I think, different things to different people. I've noticed that when I've used the term. So I see it as an umbrella term for devices which enable people to do things that they wouldn't otherwise be able to do. A typical example, and perhaps the most striking example, was the invention of the spectacles, which apparently came from China, but were picked up in, um, in Europe in the Middle Ages, the 11th or the 12th century. The spectacles enabled people who couldn't see clearly to see more clearly and extended the working lives of the population and had a major impact on the, uh, on the economic um, health, if you like, of Europe in the Middle Ages. So I think if you think of assistive technologies and things like the spectacles, um, you, will, um, you will see where today is heading. There's assistive technology and mobility in personal and emergency response systems um, for the frail and the vulnerable. Alternative communication methods for speech impairment. I think some of you will have seen that at the opening ceremony of the, uh, of the Paralympic Games with Stephen Hawking, who has the Nobel Prize for Physics, but has a condition which prevents him from communicating clearly. Limb prostheses would be another example of, uh, of assistive technology. Devices for helping deaf people hear better. Input devices and accessibility software for computers. All of these constitute assistive technology to help people to live lives to the full and do things which they couldn't otherwise do. This government is committed to innovation in this, in this area, as Lord Green has, uh, has already said. One of the things that we're interested in in the National Health Service is how we can use modern communication technology um, to save people having to come in and out of hospitals or visit um, uh, healthcare practitioners when they could just as easily stay at home. We invested a large amount of money in the largest randomized clinical trial of its kind in the world, which has led us to show that telemedicine and telehealth can not only help people improve the quality of their lives, but it can also reduce mortality from some uh, long-term conditions and reduce the rates of emergency admissions into hospital. 
We believe that there are three million people in this country who could benefit from access to that kind of technology, and the government is committed to working with industry to make that a reality. Similarly, we'll hear later in the day about the Technology Strategy uh, Board's Dallas project, which is designed to promote and facilitate the uptake of, uh, of assistive living technologies. So from my perspective, the NHS provides the perfect environment for commercial co partnership to develop these sorts of opportunities. We are the largest integrated healthcare service in the world. We're free at the point of delivery. We see over a million patients every day. Nearly 15 million patients come into hospital every year. The health service covers everything from general practice to hospitals to ambulances to dentistry to optometry and specifically to pharmacy. We're the first healthcare system in the world under this government to have a legal obligation to engage in research and innovation. And I think we're already starting to see how, um, how that legal obligation will bite. So I think the UK has got a lot to offer. It's got a lot to offer through the relationship between the um, research and development industries, whether that be in the commercial sector or in the universities. It's got a lot to offer through that collaboration with the NHS. So today, we're here to seek your partnership, your ideas, and your international collaboration. We've got a busy program this morning, so I'm delighted now to introduce David Liddington, who's the Minister of Europe in the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, and Stoke Mandeville is in his uh, parliamentary constituency, so I'm sure we'll hear more about that. David, thanks very much.